Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Bienvenue dans cette cinquième session de notre séminaire Apparence et sociabilité dans un long 18e siècle. Et donc, nous avons le plaisir aujourd'hui d'accueillir Anna Greg et Amanda Vitry pour une présentation conjointe. Euh, en anglais, une session cette fois-ci euh, en anglais. Euh, je vais peut-être laisser Ariane pr présenter aujourd'hui les, euh, les, les intervenantes et euh, comme d'habitude, nous vous demandons de, de couper euh, vos micros le temps de, de la présentation et ensuite vous aurez la possibilité à la fin de, de cette présentation de poser vos, vos questions soit en levant la main euh, euh, éventuellement vous signalant, euh, soit dans le chat également, euh, pour poser vos questions alors en anglais ou si vous avez trop de difficultés, aussi en français, il sera possible, toujours possible de traduire si vous avez besoin euh, donc, euh, de euh, traduction. Voilà. Hop. OK, so in English now, so thank you and welcome everybody to this fifth session of our uh, webinar. We have the great pleasure today of welcoming uh, Dr. Hannah Gregg and uh, Professor Amanda Vickery for a joint paper. Um, um, so uh, just a few words of introduction to uh, the uh, paper, just to say that um, so, uh, Dr. Hannah Gregg is reader in 18th century history at the University of York. Uh, Amanda Vickery is a professor uh, of history at the University of Queen Mary. She recently um, uh, obtained a fellowship from the Huntington, of which we, I'm sure we're all jealous. Um, and uh, the work they're going to be presenting is part of an ongoing uh, collaborative work, uh, uh, part of which they have published, um, especially in a uh, article published last year, was it? Or I think it was last year, in Past and Present on the season. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, this work is going to carry on and at some point, not in the exact uh, near, near future, but in a foreseeing, foreseeable future, result into an exciting book. Uh, so we're very happy to uh, welcome Hannah and Amanda. And for your questions, you during the talk, obviously, and you know, mute yourself, make sure there's no background noise. But for the questions, uh, you're welcome to uh, raise your hand and then ask your own questions. Or if you're too shy, you can also pop your questions in the chat and we can um, voice them for you. So Amanda and Hannah, the floor is yours. Thank you. The idea that 18th century Britain experienced a consumer revolution leading to the birth of the world's first consumer society has profoundly affected the way historians and others think about the period. There has been a strong tendency to exaggerate the novelty of the transformations in material life experienced in 18th century Britain. Nevertheless, there is little doubt that major changes in consumption accompanied the country's emergence in the 18th century as a successful mercantile and manufacturing economy. This, the social and economic history of consumerism in Britain has been driven by the desires and the possessions of the middling ranks. From Neil McKendrick's notorious argument that the later 18th century experienced a consumer revolution based on the desire to keep up with the Joneses, to the granular studies of middling material culture based on inventories and examinations of the relationship of gender and things. Attention has focused on the power of the growing middling ranks with the character of the aristocratic patron simplified to the point of caricature. The tastes of the aristocracy have been examined in different disciplines the history of the decorative arts and architecture. This paper bridges these two fields via a study of the commercial demography of the West End. It explores the rapid expansion of the new fashionable district of the capital, a commercial center focused on elite clientele resident there for the season. And here to demonstrate for you, we've, um, giving you a kind of close focus of 
the West End on the map. And you can see the, um, the continuity there, the Houses of Parliament in blue and St. James's Palace there in purple. You can see in 1680 that it's very much on the, that the new residential development is very much on the frontier, the very far west of uh, of London. By 1767, there's much more of a build-up and a concentration to the north. By 1843, you can see the considerable development of the West End extending all the way up there to Regent's Park at the top. As this paper will discuss, London's, oh, actually, London in 1834, yes, we'll come back to this map as well. This is to give you a sense of where we are, where we're talking about this and the change over time. So by 1834, you can see the magenta line is the outline of the old city of London. But what we're interested in is the massive growth to the West. And uh, this paper accounts for that and elaborates what it means for consumers, for the fashionable and for retailers. As this paper will discuss, London's status as a fashion capital was created by a culture of patrician politics rather than bourgeois spending. A direct response to the emergence of a new political regime after 1689. So after the glorious revolution, for the first time, politicians and their families made their seasonal home for around six months, year after year clustered in a small segment of the capital, creating a densely populated political square mile. The very same streets and squares were soon populated by purveyors of fashionable goods, targeting the daily traffic of elite personnel moving from house to house on circuits of visiting and rotating between parliament and court. Stopping off for a quick shop en route became part of elite routine. The streets, squares, and parks of St. James's, their fashion runway. This paper thinks about space, but also time. Diurnal rhythms, seasonal patterns, the life cycle, generational and dynastic time. But we also highlight, highlight movement. Some social scientists consider the spatial turn too static and promote a mobility paradigm as a new way to frame the social, tracking the movement of people, things and ideas across space and time. We emphasize the circulation of people, the routines of consumers and the agency and commercial responsiveness of retail businesses. The narrow confines of the West End ensured that elite consumerism was one integrated aspect of the political, courtly and fashionable day in the season. Now to modern eyes, Georgian London may look very small and compact. It's only a few square miles that could easily be crossed on foot. But to contemporary eyes, the capital was a breathtaking phenomenon, a very monster for greatness. To Daniel Defoe, London was the new Rome. Already in 1700, London was the largest city in Western Europe with about 575,000 souls. It was also Europe's greatest international port overhauling Amsterdam and Antwerp. And it was Britain's largest manufacturing city too. There were plenty of dirty trades from brick making and brewing to tanning and dyeing, but also the high end of most trades too. So jewellers, gold and silversmiths, clockmakers, cabinet makers and coachmakers. Now London was very administratively complex. Um, it was said to encompass two cities, London and Westminster, one borough, Southwark and 46 different villages. Now our focus is very specifically on the city that's called Westminster, which includes that area that witnessed very rapid development in the 18th century. And that area was called by the time, by contemporaries at the time as the town um, and usually referred to today as the West End, which is the term we mostly use in our paper. But it encompassed the area of St. James's, so around St. James's Palace, St. James's Square and the famous streets today like Oxford Street, Bond Street, Pall Mall and Piccadilly. 
Now, politics was critical to this West End development. 1688 and the new political regime spurred the growth of the West End because henceforward there was an annual parliament for the first time in history, British history. The sittings before 1689 were very patchy, but after that year, parliament sat year after year. And we can see this in these really useful tables that were created by the late Paul Langford in his book, Public Life and the Properties Englishman. And it charts the sittings of Parliament um, year after year. So you can see at the top of the map, I was gonna point to my pen, that's not very helpful, is it? Um, the top of the map here, it's quite patchy and scattered. And then this is where we get to 1689, 1690. And Parliament sits every single year and the lines show you the months in which they, they start and finish. So October to June here, and you can see that broadly speaking, November becomes the time that Parliament often sits and it's finishing around the end of May, sometimes goes a little bit further in, into the summer. Um, so this shift was really you know, important in terms of our constitution, in terms of constitutional significance, but it also fundamentally changed the lifestyles of those who attended. It made London residents for long periods, for many months, essential for the majority of members of the House of Commons and Lords. Parliamentarians clustered within a very small radius of London for many months of the year, thereby creating an epicenter of concentrated executive power. Now, the London of the political classes was really tiny. Um, politicians' town addresses were published in many directories and pamphlets and pocketbooks from the 1750s, which allows us to kind of map their seasonal residences with a little bit um, of precision. The gentleman's new memorandum book of 1762, for example, demonstrates that the overwhelming majority of members of the Houses of Commons and Lords had domestic addresses in the streets to the west of Farringdon and south of Oxford Street, so in our West End, basically. Only 7% of MPs, 34 members, and only two members of the House of Lords, both bishops, resided in the city, and there's a few other kind of distant outliers. And this slide, we've tried different ways to map this data, um, and because it involves so many points on the map, it becomes quite complicated, actually. But this is one attempt to map um, the House of Lords and Commons domestic residences in 1762. And we can see this area here, St. James's Palace. This is the Houses of Parliament down here. And then this is the beginnings of our, of our, our big West End development. We've also tried to do it on heat maps. Um, so this is the 1762 addresses shown slightly differently. And this is useful because it shows the density of, um, of the addresses, particularly in the West End. So we've got a few outliers out here in the city. And then as we come into our West End area, it gets hotter and hotter <laughs> as, um, as people, politicians are basically um, shoulder to shoulder, they're all neighbors with each other. Now in 1796, so that's 30 years uh, later, we see a very similar distribution with a concentration in the West End, but a slight shift northwards into yet new, net, yet more smart new squares. Um, so here's 1796, and this is the area that I'm suggesting we see a slight expansion into the north. If I just click back to 1762, you can see the concentration here. This is Oxford Street. And then after 1796, they're all still hanging around in this area, but we have more addresses up here. And these are all really quite new build areas. It's brand new um, streets and squares in the second half of, of the 18th century. So what we see from this, by mapping these addresses, we get a very tightly packed West End majority of people occupying a political square mile that includes the court, which is predominantly St. James's, and we'll come back to that, Parliament, which is down here, and then all of the shops and clubs um, and things like that, and everybody's neighbourly and it's all in close proximity. Now, the sitting of Parliament then creates a very distinctive calendar, which also shapes West End life. So as we saw on the, the maps from Paul Langford's book, Parliament might meet as early as October, but more often politicians were summoned also in January and required to stay until April, May, or sometimes June. Now, London's most famous commercial entertainments also followed suit focusing their activities on those six months when the 400 or so political families were rooted in London and able to patronise the opera, theatre and luxury trades. The responsibilities and routines of a seasonally residential political elite shaped the geography and services of the West End. Now, it's really important to note that Georgian Britain is a parliamentary monarchy. Um, it's not a parliamentary democracy. And the idea of a stable political constitution in the 18th century was one that was balanced, it was said, on the twin pillars of court and parliament, 
and the support of both King and Commons was a prerequisite for leadership. So it's Parliament and Palace in tandem that influences, we think, the development of the new West End. Now, London lacks a grand palace in the 18th century. We have nothing that competes with Versailles. After Whitehall Palace burned down in 1697, there's no preeminent court venue in London. Ceremony and residence are increasingly diverged across a number of different palaces. So with Kensington Palace and the Queen's House, which later becomes Buckingham Palace, mostly used for domestic residences, so lodging the royals and the, their attendants, while St James's was used for balls and drawing rooms and ceremonies. So lacking a single grand palace, London's court culture was very dispersed. And this dispersal integrated the court within the fashionable metropolitan landscape, exposing the ritualistic performances of royalty and courtiers to the public gaze. Now, the West End was a town that was um, designed to accommodate bodies in motion. Its seasonal, residents, its seasonal residents were constantly on the move throughout an ordinary day. High ranking ministers were required at court on a daily basis, and the majority of noble lords attended multiple times a week, while their wives attended drawing rooms and balls. After court, which is mostly at St. James's, the gentlemen then made their way to Parliament. And unlike the iconic building that stands by the Thames today, the old parliament had no purpose-built parliamentary accommodation. It's, it remains in what's the remains of the original um, Whitehall Palace. The House of Lords convened in the Queen's Chamber, which was a former medieval hall. And the Commons were squeezed into a deconsecrated chapel, St Stephen's, which could only accommodate around half the MPs who officially made up the house. The rambling Warren and cramped debating rooms of Parliament were far from conducive to the increased business and extended sittings wrought by the post-1689 constitutional change. So just as a multiplicity of small court sites forced courtiers and nobles to move around the West End map, the spatial politics of Parliament also spilled men into the surrounding streets. Government administration often had to be performed off-site in satellite buildings in the townhouses, coffee houses, chocolate shops, and later the clubs of the new West End. There is no end to their going in and out, as one tourist observed of the parliamentary routine. Now, the diaspora of politics creates a constant traffic around St. James's and Westminster, as members, officials, ladies and gentlemen, lobbyists, secretaries, messengers, servants, sedan chairs and coaches had to circulate between court, parliament, and ministers' palatial houses. Westminster was one of the first towns in the country for which far-reaching street legislation was passed, the Westminster Paving Act of 1762. And the pavements and all-night illumination of the West End became the envy of Europe. The footfall of the powerful at all hours was what drove this path-breaking piece of legislation. Indeed, we think it's always really striking that the number of images that we see of 18th century London streets represent people on the move, on foot, in carriages and in sedan chairs. The circulation of the fashionable about the West End represented a new retail opportunity. However, conspicuous consumption did not rise sui generis. Shops, of course, are as old as towns. Medieval shopping centred on Cheapside, while there were shops in, the hou in houses on London Bridge from the 14th century. In the 17th century, the gentry noted coming to London to see the new fashions. A prescient consumer could glimpse the future at four custom-built shop shopping galleries, the Royal Exchange on Cornhill in the city, the New Exchange on the south side of the Strand, and the shorter lived Exeter Exchange and the Middle Exchange also on the Strand. The exchanges were early designer shopping malls, palatial in construction, but filled with tiny fashionable boutiques. As the bricks of the new West End consumed the fields of Mayfair, fresh concentration of shops came to rival the bustling warehouses and shops of the city. The new exchange on the Strand was demolished in 1737 as the frontier of fashion marched further west. 
1750, the 21,600 shops of London represented a ratio of one per 30 of the population. And in fact, it was uh, Napoleon, not Hitler, who first said that the British are a nation of shopkeepers. The shops of the metropolis were arranged in two parallel ribbons running east-west, explained a London guidebook in 1803. The northern ribbon ran from Shoreditch to Holborn, St Giles and on to Oxford Street. The southern line was considered more splendid, extended from Mile End to Parliament Street. Smaller shopping streets ran parallel uh, or intersected. And in fact, the most splendid um, and exquisite of the shops were considered, you can see some of those in the city of the Blue Cross there, but the most uh, luxurious were the ones that were intersecting around St. James's Palace. A westward trend in businesses which serve the Beaumont is discernible. Warehouses selling masquerade costumes were based around the Opera House and Covent Garden in the first half of the century, finds Megan Kobska in her work on masquerades. By the 1760s and 70s, similar costume suppliers had opened on Oxford Street and New Bond Street, and by 1785 to 1800, they were to be found on Pall Mall too. Bond Street is the very quintessence of the Grand Monde, trilled a doctor's daughter in 1746. Of course, there were shops and shops. There was a world of difference between the stock, shop fit and customer base of the secondhand clothes dealer and the goldsmith. But countesses could not live on silver and silks alone. Even dukes needed coal, milk and bread. The West End had its mundane shops too. Nevertheless, it was most remarkable for the luxury <coughs> trades. For example, merchants who held the royal warrant were mostly based there. Of the 104 businesses listed as supplying the royal household in a London trade di directory of 1794, 72 had at least one West End address. Some had two. Elite shopping had its own season geography and timetable. As far as the governing ranks were concerned, the true social season only began when they were summoned, be that October or January, and ended the second they left. The West End was synonymous with fashion change. The summoning of Parliament at the King's request and the announcement of a new timetable of court events signaled the opening of the season, the beginning of a new term and the launch of new fashions, the Georgian equivalent of Vogue September issue. Observers had to wait for the ladies of fashion to exhibit themselves to be sure which styles would predominate. Hence, in September 1772, schoolmaster's wife, Bessie Ramsden, was devoid of fashion information. Uh, as she wrote to a northern cousin, there is no fashions come out yet for the winter. Those in the business of fashion might try to predict the coming trends based on the emerging looks at the end of the previous season, but they could not be sure. Bessie Ramsden's mantua maker was still guessing as late as November in 1776, based on the direction of travel the previous winter. As again, she wrote to her cousin, and as for fashion, I have taken a great deal of pains to know about the gold trimmings. My mantua maker says it's too early to determine what for will for a certainty be worn as the town is yet very empty. But she makes no doubt that gold and silver trimmings will be thought very genteel as they was coming very much in last winter. It was a court convention that courtiers wore new clothes for the big court events, hence the fillet to fashion and the efforts of tourists and Londoners to get as close as possible to observe and report. On the Queen's birthday, generally hairdressers go to see the present fashions. One defendant testified to the Old Bailey in April 1790. Beyond the court, the Beaumont wore their most fashionable full dress at sheet venues like the Opera, the Pantheon, uh, the Ridotto and so on, and paraded in equally fashionable, though more informal attire in the mornings and parks. Their dress was seen in public and detailed in the London newspapers, thereby fixing the latest trends and disseminating them. 
Nevertheless, the creation of fashion in dress, textiles, ceramics, and metalwares was an alchemical process. It was not enough to create something new. Many innovative designs were resisted. As Joss Wedgwood, son of the great Potter, warned his brother Tom in 1790, your black tea wear with lively colors, I dare say will please the foreigners, but the English, I'm afraid, will not admire them. We are not bold enough to adopt at once anything that is new and beautiful, but require the sanction of fashion to give it value. Their father, Josiah Wedgwood, famously sought the patronage of ladies of quality, those who he called the legislators of taste, who would hallmark his goods as fashionable and so lead the way. As he concluded, few ladies venture out of the common style till authorized by their betters. So, the, and by their betters, he meant the ladies of the superior spirit who set the tone. Trends in fashion were created by the interaction of the producer, the high profile consumer and publicity. There was a seasonal pattern to trade as we have seen, but also something of a daily rhythm. London shops were often open until 10 at night. Ladies' diaries suggest they often did errands late morning. Couples toured the finest showrooms before and after parliament. Lady Shelburne, uh, wife of the future prime minister recorded one such outing in January, 1766. Lord Shelburne went with us before the house floors to Casale and Cipriano, both painters. In the first, we were disappointed. The latter showed us some very pretty things. Amongst others, a circle for a ceiling of Lord Northumberland, of Joe, Venus and Mercury, representing, paint, sorry, painted on a gold ground and enclosed in a circle representing the signs of the zodiac. It was so late that Lord Shelburne could stay with us no longer. So obviously he'd gone back to Parliament. Tourist commentary asserts that the afternoon was the most popular time for conspicuous consuming. Dusk was the typical time for shoplifting, for obvious reasons. The shops of the West End were seen as a spectacular circuit integrated within a geography of culture. Guidebooks advertised tourist routes around the most dazzling shops, embracing Wedgwood's Warehouse in St. James's Square, Tassie's artificial stone shop on Leicester Square, and Hatchet's coach, coach manufactory, manu, manufactory on Long Acre. Josiah Wedgwood opened showrooms on Newport Street, aware that Bolton was showing on Pall Mall. Oh, what a coursing there will be from Pall Mall to Newport Street and Newport Street to Pall Mall, he boasted. The studios of artists and luxury craftsmen were showrooms for work in progress displaying major commissions to the public before sending to the buyer was a common practice. Quote, the Duchess of Argyle's dress has been sometime exhibited at the milliners, reported Lady Williams Wynne of the coronation clothes in 1824. The train alone of it cost 200 pounds. Frederick Robinson went to, went to Hatchet's the Coachmaker in December, 1778, expressly to see a costly commission for a nabob on show at his workshop on Long Acre. Luxury businesses also pursued elite patrons in person. Josiah Wedgwood routinely loitered in the corridors of court in season touting for business. Pray put on your best suit of clothes you ever had in your life and take the first opportunity of going to court, he urged his brother John. The Birmingham metalwares king, Matthew Bolton, often came to London between January and April to develop custom and to lobby MPs for the Birmingham interest. He made house calls to key influencers. Calling at Shelburne House on Barclay Square, he found Lady Shelburne ill with a putrid sore throat and unable to come downstairs. Quote, and therefore wish you could have a few of my pretty things in her room to amuse her. I therefore took coach and fetched a load for her and sat with her ladyship two hours explaining and hearing her criticisms. Indulging the whims and flattering the judgment of the customers was part and parcel of the business. 
The airiness with which aristocrats summon suppliers is astounding. I, do, I diverted myself very much with making shopkeepers bring me all sorts of pretty things to look at, reported Lady Sarah Lennox, daughter of the Duke of Richmond in the 1770s. The end of the parliamentary season and the departure of elite clients from their townhouses to the country in May or June brought a climax to the commercial activity in the West End. With the end of term impending, Bolton was feeling the pressure in the spring, sending to Birmingham for extra vases, quote, for all the push I can make must be before the parliament breaks up, which is supposed to be at the beginning of April. In the late 1780s, Dyed & Co on Pall Mall initiated the end of season sale, selling off their stock of fripperies at half price, as usual every year in the last week of May. Many other businesses advertised their willingness to execute orders remotely from their London stores when customers left town for the country. Some businesses followed the tongue out of town. Outside the season, fashion was at a standstill. Complaints from visitors about the dearth of fashion out of season are numerous. In 1736, when George II stayed in Hanover into November, Lord Harvey noted that the London tradesmen were unhappy as they thought the King's absence prevented people coming to town. And in this print, lots of people are you know, complaining that they can't get any commissions, they can't get any work, so nothing is happening in London. The consequences for business of the absence of the quality resounded in satire. A series from 1790, Everybody Out of Town, dramatize the economic consequences for milliners, doctors, even undertakers. And so um, as you're looking, I suppose, uh, as I look at it on my left, you see a doctor and an undertaker complaining, well, as you see, it's not fashionable for people to die in London during the summer. But then on uh, my right, as I look at it, we see a, a hatter, and uh, well, what Hannah put a courtesan, and I would say is a prostitute, so she's very charming. So, but nobody's getting any work, nobody's got um, the quality trade. And, you know, there are a few other uh, prints like this on this theme. The Beaumont considered London a city of some 650,000 people in 1750 empty once they had departed. So generally in the literature um, that we've kind of read so far, the emergence of the West End is often accepted as an unproblematic part of the mushroom growth of London. But to contemporaries, however, the West End was a brand new town celebrated as the acme of Georgian modernity, but viewed as an economic threat to the city. Plans for a new bridge in Westminster were thwarted in 1662 and 1722 by the City of London, concerned that a bridge to Westminster would direct trade straight into the West End, bypassing the city. It was said that it will enrich the inhabitants of Westminster and impoverish the citizens of London. In short, it will make Westminster a fine city and London a desert. Now, this is not to deny that there was enormous wealth, of course, in the city of London. The great wholesale merchants were all based in the city, supplying retailers nationally and internationally. Nor did the West End efface retail in the East. All of the leading luxury commodities could be found in the city and often at better prices. The East India Company auctions were famed for Exotica and the fashionable sometimes went on shopping expeditions east. But nevertheless, the shops of the West End were seen to be more fashion forward, if costlier than the city. The tourist Johanna Schopenhauer reported in the 1790s, quote, the stores and shops offer only what the most refined taste for luxury demands. And although the goods are much more expensive than in the city, they are more beautiful, more fashionable, more elegant. The fashionable drove fashion. Their metropolitan presence was critical to London businesses and the launch of the new season of style. Now Wedgwood differentiated between what he called the numerous class of people who purchase showy and cheap things 
and the great people, the ladies of superior spirit who set the ton. 300 noble families were not the entire consumer society, of course, but they held disproportionate wealth, prominence and power to legislate taste, to govern the behavior of retailers in London and to engineer the outlines of fashion for tens of thousands, if not millions across the English speaking globe. Now the shopping habits of one particular family, I think helps bring the association between court, parliament, aristocratic townhouse, and the purveyors of fine goods into sharper focus. From the late 1760s, the family of John Spencer, first Earl Spencer, routinely spent the parliamentary season at the newly built Spencer House at 27 St. James's Street. So this is right next to St. James's Palace. The family's receipts reveal a constellation of shops within easy reach of their front door. Now the Countess of Spencer helpfully kept a little notebook of her preferred London tradesmen. And if we look at this, we find that only 10 of the 97 businesses that she records in that notebook were located east of Chancery Lane. And I'm sorry I've put this onto a Google map rather than a history map. I haven't had a chance yet to export the data, but it gives you a sense of the spread. And these are all marks on the map that relate to this notebook that's kept by, by Lady Spencer. And you can see that the vast majority, obviously over here in the West End, this red building here is Spencer House. This is St. James's Palace and just nudged down there is the Houses of Parliament. So we've got a big kind of concentration here and then a little bit of a scattering out into the city. And I had to look at her notebook again the other day and all of these city ones are sort of the slightly oily things. So there's the rust man and the, the tallow chandler and um, the, the kind of wax supplier and, and things like that um, from the city. But the vast majority of the shops that she frequents are located within a mile or less from her house here, Spencer House. And most of them are immediately outside her front door. So this is St. James's Street. This is um, her house. This is Piccadilly, Pall Mall, and then Oxford Street's just a little bit further up there. St. James's Street outside her front door then was lined with shops that met every need of the Georgian quality. In 1794, the Council of Spencer's list included three perfumers, two shoemakers, two jewelers, two hatters, two linen drapers, a spur maker, a chandler, a chemist, a hairdresser, of course, a dice maker, a bookseller, a print seller, a grocer, a tea merchant, an instrument maker, a tailor, an optician, a Chinaman, um, who's a dealer in porcelain. And also notably, many of these businesses also held a royal warrant and some of them still remain today. So this is a picture of Lock & Co, a hatters on St. James's Street, which is one of a couple of shops that were established in the 18th or early 19th century that still remain in St. James's today. And actually I have a picture, which I haven't put in the PowerPoint of Amanda trying on a hat just above Lock & Co's. Um, but anyway, we'll try and circulate that at, at some other time. Anyway, the shopping loyalties of other members of um, the Spencer family also followed a similar pattern. So the menfolk, the first Earl Spencer and his young son, Lord Elthrop, were kitted out by gentlemen outfitters who ranged along St. James's Street, um, St. James's Market, Old Bond Street and Piccadilly. The furthest east they went um, for clothing was to Covent Garden, and that was to buy ready-made breeches. Spencer's trend-setting daughters, Georgiana, later Duchess of Devonshire, and Henrietta, later Countess of Besborough, patronised hatters and hosiers on Piccadilly, they bought their shoes in St. James's Street and their silk on Pall Mall. Now, building a long-term relationship with an aristocratic family was a very savvy business move by the purveyors of luxury goods. Establishing premises on their doorstep helped attract their trade and secure their loyalty. So many of the businesses who dressed the 12-year-old George Spencer when he was heading off to boarding school also retained his custom when he came of age at 16, and most importantly, when he inherited the earldom from his father, aged 25 in 1783. When their daughter, Georgiana Spencer, married the Duke of Devonshire, her father sank over 1,400 pounds into new clothes and shoes for the bride's trousseau. Hunt and Cunningham on the corner of St. James's Street received an order for no less than 26 pairs of gloves um, to see Georgiana off into married life. So the long-standing investment made by businesses in keeping their aristocratic clients happy, including tolerating the very late payment settling, the very late settlement sometime of accounts, 
all paid off royally at major life-changing moments such as marriage, coming in of age and inheritance. So the history of London commerce, you know, we're quite familiar with the idea that there's a drift west from the city and from Covent Garden and the Strand into this new West End. But it almost is implying as though shopkeepers are rudderless ships floating on a tide. But the letters of the most ambitious argue that they took a very strategic decision to set up shop exactly where there was now a new concentration of nobles who were brought to London and staying in London for the political season. So just to summarise a few of our key points um, in our paper, you know, what we think is very important is that there's the possibility of the elite sort of dropping into the shop on their perambulations um, around town when they're moving between court and parliament um, and their townhouse. And also the fact that the quality expected to be visited at home by these merchants increased the viability of a West End base. And Amanda and I are often quite amused by some of those quotes about these aristocratic ladies summoning these shopkeepers and making them sit for three hours whilst they look through all of their, their, their products. Proximity to fashion leaders actually spared the tradesmen the long trek from the city. It enabled them to make a series of home visits in the day and also kept their stock very close at hand. Historians are apt to stress the lure of the season, the fashionable entertainment, and the importance of shopping on consumers, especially female consumers. But this analysis, we think, puts the cart before the horse. Rather than being drawn to London by the glitter of shops, by entertainment and fashion, the peerage and parliamentary classes came for Parliament, and the new culture was built around them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this paper. So if you have um, questions, you can um, maybe raise your hand and we can, you're welcome to put your cameras back on if you want to, obviously. Um, and if you have questions, you can raise your hand and unmute yourself. If there's not too many people at the same time. Maybe I'll start with a question uh, so that people can gather their thoughts. Um, I was really interested in that interweaving that you're working on between the political season and the fashion season and the urban fabric. Um, and I was just wondering how um, your story uh, uh, leads into or doesn't lead into the story that uh, Christopher Broad uh, uh, writes about the way the co-construction as well of the dandy culture and, city, and the city of London. Uh, I'm not really sure what his geography was, but he was he's kind of working on that interconnection between city, the city development and the fashion development, how they co-build um, themselves or each other. Hmm. Well, that, that's 19th century, I know. Yeah, yeah I think, I mean, um... It's a world since I've, I've looked at Chris's work, but his, his focus used to be mostly on 1800s. And um, um, so I, I you know, could be wrong about what he's ar arguing now, but I think that um, you know, it's important that we don't want to sort of deny the power of the city. I think it's perfectly possible to write another study that looks at city communities um, you know, around that kind of city culture, particularly banks and lawyers and, and all of the existing city infrastructure that's there. You know, we there are warehouses there, there are shops there, there are goods that you can buy there. Our fashionable society from the West End sometimes make excursions into the city for particular reasons. So it's not as though the city is drained of its of its kind of you know world of goods at all. But we're interested in in this emergence of this new space as well, this new town, and how that integrates all of these elements of of shops and house and parliament and court. And it has a distinctive culture, I think, to the city. But I think we'd probably be challenged by people who work on the city, wouldn't we, Amanda? <laughs> I, I, I don't know whether he works on the city city, like, right. as, like well, the city of London. I think, you know, it's London as a, the way we understand uh, London yeah. okay. as city today as a capital city. I, did, I yeah. don't think he, he meant an opposition between the kind of the old city and the, and the new the west, city. The yeah. west End. Well, if I remember his geography correctly, he, uh, in his book on masculinity, he had three geographies. He had the West End, he had Holborn, and then he had kind of Hackney. Mm. And so what, but what he was trying to look at there was actually low middle class culture. So, so these, his dandies, they were all young clerks. 
and they lived in Hackney. And so, um, I mean, he wants to present them as, you know, kind of avatars of modernity, but the dandyism that they're mimicking is actually gentlemen of the West End. Mm. So but he looked at these three different kind of shopping regions and how, and because he's working on the late 19th century, you know, it's kind of a, a, a different sort of commercial world really, with much more kind of ready to wear, um, with the emergence of a sort of, you know, a, a much more clearly defined lower middle class and, um, and sort of, a, a, it, that's a kind of subculture really, but people, but by the late 19th century, you know, there's this awareness of what the West End dandy is. And then there's much kind of, um, you know, kind of humor and mimicry. So a very popular East End song is Burlington Bertie. I'm Burlington Bertie, I rise at 6.30. And it's a musical song and people sing it in the East End. And it's, it's sort of, it's more or less about a kind of tramp mimicking the behavior of the kind of, of the West End toff. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that Chris would argue that they're, you know, that, they're, that his clerks are the leading edge of fashion. But I think he's saying they're putting it together in interesting ways that, um, you know, and, and that they're low middle class consumers. So they, but at the same time, you know, they're trying very hard to keep their suits um, pressed, but they, uh, you know, but they are, you know, an unusual kind of group of men and they seem to be domesticated and they often have little um, brooches in their ties, which suggest they're interested in ballet and things like that. And also they're some of the first men to sign up for the German gyms. Oh, are they? Oh, I love those gyms. And um, <laughs> but of course, you know, the most famous dandy that's kind of thought to be Beau Brummel, really, in the early 1800s. And, and he does quite a lot to sort of disseminate the idea of a West End fashion because he writes these guidebooks, kind of, you know, how to be a dandy, uh, you know, the fashion handbook uh, by Beau Brummel, master of fashion. And, but he is identifies very strongly with the West End in that mm. he's a friend of the Prince of Wales. He sits in his club in St. James's Street, allegedly sitting in the window so everybody can see the clothes he's got on that day. Um, so he's sort of disseminating this idea, isn't he, of the West End dandy, presumably to this, this wider audience that Chris is interested in. If Chris is there in the audience, you can answer. <laughs> yeah. But also the proto-dandies are the men like the Macaroni, who were mm. all aristocratic young men who've come back from the Grand Tour. And they're, you know, they're trying to kind of show off in the clubs and the streets of the West End. Hannah, we have a question. I'm not sure how we'd answer this. Could you argue to some extent that the new commercial space and so public street culture could be described as gendered female? I don't think that is what we're arguing, is it? Because we're, you know, we're interested in both men and women moving around these spaces. And what I think one of the things that we found from our work on the political day is that a man's day actually really rather resembled a woman's day in many ways, because they were always going off to levees and clubs and, you know, that they were in traffic. So I think there are flows of men and women across Westminster, you know, at all hours is what I would say, but, but sometimes the man's day and the woman's day diverges, but because men spend so little time in parliament, they reunite with their women folk, but in contrast to the city. Mm. Any thoughts? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think that, yeah, I think, as you said, our, our starting point is that they're not very explicitly gendered um, in terms of the actual practicality of what people do and how they spend their time in the West End and who they are and how they move around those spaces. Of course, against that, you need to have the idea of what the satires and the kind of visual culture of the day are doing. And then, of course, there is, particularly in the late 18th century, a very predominant idea that the world of the Beaumont, the world of fashion, is led by these women who are, you know, leading everybody astray, who are, um, you know, sending politics into a disarray. But that is a kind of satirical discourse that has a particular 
potentially political political edge, I think, to it as well. Um, and I don't think that what we see on actually happening in people's diaries and letters and their actual practices necessarily marries directly with that, that, that idea of the West End being predominantly female led. Um, but we're probably a few tensions there because we love the idea of the female influencer, though, don't we? So we're probably working a few of our own tensions in <laughs> to the paper. But actually, Hannah, I was thinking one thing we'd add, I think we'd add, though, um, is that aristocratic women are allowed a public life that few women of lower down the social ranks are. And so aristocratic women go to court on their own. You know, they go to dinners on their own, they go to balls on their own, and they're expected to lead. They, they consider themselves as public people leading public lives. And somebody like Bessie Ramsden, who lives in the city, who I quoted, she would not consider herself kind of entitled to a public life. She's always having to apologise for, you know, leaving her nursery and, oh, I'm only going shopping. I'll be back soon. And so I do, I think it's probably true to say that women have are, are more high profile in uh, 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 rich women are, are much more high profile on the streets of Westminster than perhaps they are in the city. But the city moves to slightly different rhythms anyway because it's it's time to you know the bells of, of the exchange. But but all the streets of both the city and Westminster, I think, are thronged with. Um, uh, consumers, um, delivery boys, you know, postmen, footmen, uh, servants, uh, tourists, um, and inhabitants, and and of course beggars and the poor and prostitutes. I mean, it's a cliche that the city of London is like thrumming by nine o'clock in the morning, and Westminster's dead before noon. Yeah. because they've all been up all night. But, uh, and so that might be true, that there's a different kind of rhythm to the two. Thank you very much. Don't be shy and... I can see Rebecca there. Rebecca, have you got a question? I, I wanted to ask you, Rebecca, a question which I thought we might be asked. Uh. Can oh, you Amanda's on it now, isn't she? She's picking on people up. Because <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca, I thought we would be asked, what about Paris and flat? <laughs> Are you there? I am. Um, sorry, I just had to kind of shift screens around because. Um, but I, I, I wanted to ask you, Rebecca, of yeah. the Mantua makers, to what mm -hmm. extent do they think they are following French fashion? Do they? Are they? Or do they think London fashion is something different from Paris fashion? Um, I think, um, I'm still working on this. I, th I, th I think there's always this sort of thing that, that, that they feel that they're following pa Paris fashion, or at least their clients want to be following Paris fashion. Um, and I, I have a feeling as well, when you get to sort of the end of the 18th century, when you have the emigres um, after the revolution in London, there's also a sort of another shift in how milliners and mantra makers work. Because mm. um, my issue with mantra makers is that they're so private. They're unlike most of the other fashion trades. They don't have a, a shop front that you know. <laughs> I'm, I've, I've found very few, and it's only once they start to call themselves dressmakers yeah. in the yeah. early um, 1800s that they start to, to have a, a shop, a store, um, and become more public facing. So I have this this problem that they're, they're sort of they're the, they seem to be the, the one fashion trade that is is very mm. private and tucked away. Thank you. So, <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> I'd love it if they had shops. It would make life easy. <laughs> so we have questions in the in the chat. Can you see them? Yeah, from Annie. So two questions. One is around interiors and whether you see much difference in the shopping experience in Westminster versus the city. And the second is whether along the clothing coaches, you also have much on confectioners, caterers, high end in Westminster. <laughs> um, mm. um, one of the things which is 
distinctive to Westminster that Hannah and I have found is that um, the suppliers often have to go to visit nobles at home. They're like, I don't know if it's familiar in France, but in Britain and North America, there was this phenomenon of the Avon lady who come round house to house with a sort of case of makeup and, you know, and sell it. But they're a bit like door-to-door -door salesmen. And I don't think that goes on in the city. That's the sort of thing so that they, so sometimes a lot of these nobles do not deign to go to the shop. You know, they want to have the private encounter. And, um, as, and if you just set your mind back to what Lady Shelburne was saying, she was saying, you know, or Bolton was saying, you know, I heard her criticisms for two hours. So, you know, he is the master producer and he has to hear Lady Shelburne saying, I don't think that's very good. And then, you know, oh, this would be better if it was pink. And he has to say, very good, my lady, very good. And so it gives them the idea that they're sort of, they are tastemakers and that they're kind of in control. So I think that's one of the things that's distinctive. I Clearly, but also clearly the shops of the West End, insofar as we can tell from tourist commentary, are remarkably glittering and have this kind of um, a sort of museum quality, a gallery quality. And lots of people talk about, you know, the amazing illumination and the plate glass. And, and for some of these, like clearly Wedgwood wants people to kind of loiter and meet each other in his showroom. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think what we need to do some more thinking about for that as well is the impact of the season on the West End, which is the main thing we're kind of interested in as well. And, and what, whether that is replicated at all in the city, or whether the city has a different rhythm across the year, because it does seem to be, you know, fairly clear that the West End businesses shift their way of working once the elite leave town, um, you know, for the summer. So, um, you know, Bolton goes back to Birmingham, um, Astley, the, the horse guy, goes off doing kind of country circuses and, and goes to teach people horse riding at home in the countryside. Um, some of the West End shops start having the end of season sale. Um, and so there's a kind of the seasonality of the West End is something that we're really kind of interested in. And I think that would be the main way for us to try and think a bit more about mm. that question going forwards. Um, confectioners, yes, we do get confectioners in the West End. I can yeah, eat some of them if I want. So there is a um, confectioner on St. James's Street that Lady Spencer uses. And I've been doing quite a lot of work on royal warrant holders, for kind of related but, but separate project on court material culture. And of course, there's a lot of um, kind of food related suppliers to court um, who have business operations very close to the palaces. Um, and, you know, they often don't go very far afield, any of these clients, <laughs> um, in terms of um, who they're patronising. So yeah, there is a lot um, in terms of caterers, confectioners, um, food suppliers as well um, um, in the West End. Um, I think, um, Rebecca, you raise a very good point there about the relative commercial freedom of the West End as opposed to the control of, um, say, livery companies in the city. And that is something we're going to think about in future. But I had a question for the people who work on France, it was also my understanding that Marie Antoinette wear, has new clothes and gives away all her clothes once or twice a year. And so, and, and I, I wondered if you could, if anybody could throw any light on that. And, and one of the arguments that's made in Britain about one of the things that creates the kind of fashion cycle is the introduction of new designs by Leon silk merchants. I don't know if it's once or twice a year. So that's often regarded in the historiography as something that's absolutely key to the cycle of fashion. So I just wondered if anybody could say anything about the timetable in Versailles of, you know, of new clothes, because then you know, that, that might help us think about you know, the timings of you know, the new things on offer in London. You don't have to answer. <laughs> Aurélie, any thoughts on that? Well, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think there's a kind of cycle, yeah, maybe um, um, 
every four four months, every uh, for uh, from spring uh, for extra for uh, winter for uh, for the seasons. I think there is season cycle. In fact, yeah, uh, we can see in the. Um, and the uh, accounts uh, that uh, the princesses uh, ordered uh, dresses uh, for for seasons. I think, yeah, it's a kind of uh, season cycles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I'm not sure that we see a weather-related season cycle in the shopping press of Billy. It tends to be a massive set of purchases in the run-up to the parliamentary season, and then you're kind of good for the season, and then you you restock again over mm. the summer so it'd be interesting to think about the different kind of rhythms of what we think of now as the fashion cycle and a fashion season and when that kind of starts to be introduced um i just picking up again on rebecca's question about commercial freedom in the west end as opposed to the control of the companies in the city like the role of the city guilds you know one of the things i've been trying to think about is these is the impact of the royal warrant and how the court actually informs kind of people's business practices and um and how it controls it and it certainly isn't anywhere near like a guild but it is subject to some particular kinds of, of regulations and rhythms and things like that so i think i might i might look to the guild literature actually to see if i can move that on a bit more because um there is a sort of interesting business infrastructure i think that we see developing in the west end around the court and its particular requirements. And that does become formalized through the system of a royal warrants gradually over the course of the 18th century, but it's still quite shadowy. And some people claim it when they don't have it and, um, and everyone gets very cross about it. And then by the 19th century, there's a bit of a crackdown. <laughs> um, but I'm interested in those kinds of, yeah, those business practices as well. So I think, I think maybe the guilds would be a good place to look for that. Because I've always thought when they, they boasted that they had royal patronage and that there was just a marketing technique more than you know that didn't really mean because the, you know how many traders can have the official royal war and can be the official supplier of of this or that good so I, I always thought it was kind of more marketing technique than an actual endorsement I think I think it's both of those things as well and, and I was surprised by how many businesses claimed to a royal connection that actually did seem to have it so I think even though it doesn't have to be a kind of official warrant if you have supplied the court then you can sort of say I am a such, such and such to the, the royal household and the other thing that happens particularly in the British court system is you get a lot of multiple households so you get the suppliers to the king and to the queen and to the prince of Wales and then to the duke of Gloucester and then to you know and it kind of multiplies and multiplies and multiplies and so some suppliers then list all of the royals that they they you know supply and um and particularly in 18th century, when the Prince of Wales is competing politically with the king, there's a kind of fracturing of parliament and the Prince of Wales goes totally, you know, he, he goes consumer crazy and he, you know, tries to be the patron of every single shop in the West End and um, partly as a kind of political statement as well. So there's a kind of, you know, there's a push from the court as well around this. And, um, but anyway, it's hard to get the data because it's really hard to marry the court records to the to the shop records because the court records are not easy to, to navigate but I did look at um there's lists of um the, the people the furniture historians are brilliant so the, the furniture history has published all of this database records about furniture makers in 18th century Britain and London and I've looked through those for the court makers and they've also logged exactly whether or not they can find them in the court records and only a very small proportion of those about two percent were claiming a court affiliation and didn't have it and that was from many hundreds of furniture traders in 18th century London so I think you could have this massive massive kind of replication of this court affiliation um, that was probably more truthful than we might suspect but I was really surprised because I thought as well it was just a business it's just an advertising ploy I just want to find out about it as a brand what's it mean but actually there does seem to be more more actual business origins to those claims than, than I had supposed. Thank you. Do we have other questions from the audience? You can pop your question in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask your question. You can ask your question in French. Vous pouvez poser vos questions en français et on peut les traduire.
Well, I'll go ahead with another question. Um, uh, so, so you insisted on how dull it was for the traders when you know the town was out of town, when the people were out of town, when it was out of the season. But and you mentioned that Bolton would go back to Birmingham, and but what would they do? You have a sense of what would traders do like in that sort of dull time, ex except complain, obviously. <laughs> So I mean, they I think use that in a, in their marketing, like okay, so we've got to be ready for. Um... Yeah, they they advertise. They remind everybody that of course they have all their sizes and their information. So if they want to send commissions, what's there in the country, you know, filling time, they can just write to the the trader and let them know what they need, and they'll get it made up for the new season. So there's quite a lot of emphasis on on you know future planning for the next season and reminding people that they can do that remotely. Um, and then they also chase bills a lot. <laughs> so they say, there's an awful lot of like trying to get people to pay for things, <laughs> reminding them that they still got to pay when they come back. There's a lot of accounting and um, you see a kind of flurry in the business records um, at the end of the season as they're sort of, yeah, trying to figure out uh, what, you know, what, what adds up to what. Um, so you see that. And then you do get, I am quite interested in the way in which they move out of town themselves or they try and divert diversify their business um, by by following the trades to the countryside as well. Um, so yeah, the, the different sorts of strategies, I think. And do they do they go to Bath and that kind of thing or not really? Do they kind of try to follow? We haven't found any of the big businesses doing that yet, but um, maybe Rebecca can comment on it, but I'm sure <laughs> some hairdressers, milliners, you can tell from advertisements that, you know, that, that some women who are a bit more mobile are going, you know, going to Bath, going to Brighton, going to Bristol. But the other thing is that, you know, that there are other consumers other than the nobles. And so, you know, there are provincial tourists, there are international tourists, and then there are all the inhabitants of London who, you know, maybe they get away for a week's holiday but you know they're there and so you know that that they can be keeping the whole thing ticking over uh, but also all these business um a lot of the these shops are accessed by provincial people through proxy consumers and and by letter and so you know, but but at a certain point in the season i think they as you could hear tell from the bessie ramsden correspondence um a provincial consumer might not want to make the choice of silk in July. Mm. They, they might they want to slip it later. Yeah, they'd probably try to hang on till November mm. because they don't want to be caught out. And, and also I think it's useful for us to keep in mind that a lot of the, the businesses are not just about buying a whole new product, but you know, people like sword cutlers or something, sometimes they're they're, you know, refreshing something that's got a bit old or they're adding something on. There's a kind of accessorizing of existing goods that goes on. So, you know, a long time ago when I was working on the Beaumont, I, I looked a bit at kind of, of diamonds and jewelers in 18th century London. And so much of their business was actually remaking things or, or tidying things up and adding things in. So I think there's a lot of that kind of work that's going on in that business, which is presumably all year round. And I imagine, but haven't really looked at it in much detail, there's a lot of like racing into the townhouses when the elite have gone to the country to re-guild all of the sconces that are up and to go in and touch up the paintwork and to you know, make sure the curtains are fine. So there's this when all the bug destroyers, I love bug destroyers in London, they go in and they deflee all of the um, furniture and things like that. So I think there's probably a kind of flurry of that kind of activity that happens as well. Um, but that's just a kind of, yeah, mm. I suggestion rather than as yet <laughs> proven through the historical records. But um, I think there's some of that going on. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm guessing with Hannah there too, because if you look at like upholsterers account books, an awful lot of what upholsterers are doing is, is kind of mending and debugging and all of that. And so I would imagine that, that uh, you know, when, when the great family leaves, they leave a skeleton staff behind in the townhouse. And so that's when there would be this kind of behind the scenes. Uh, there was a question about how did traders manage to survive while they waited for payment? Well, that is the eternal cry. But the whole of 18th century uh, manufacturing and retail 
all works on credit. So you've just got, an, and that's why, you know, being a credit worthy person is so important, but that's also why there's so much bankruptcy. Mm. So but, that's why it's very high risk. It is sort of high risk, but high payoff having these nobles. And I'd always, um, you know, until Hannah did this marvelous work on Lady Spencer's notebook, I often wondered why did they even bother with these people who like might not pay for years. But, but her finding about, you know, these big wins at times, you know, at key times suggests why it might be worth it. But they are notorious for the mm. poor payment of debts. And so, mm. um, but I think, you know, that they probably buy a lot of their stock on credit and the uh, consumers are getting it on credit. You, you, you do get a lot of businesses worry. that go to the wall. Yeah, you do. There's a massive. There's a, it's huge. Right, there's a big bankruptcy story to tell um, for, for 18th century London. It often feels like a bit of a gamble. But then, of course, it's interesting that the most famous business names that we know of today, like Bolton and Wedgwood, are those who, you know, tried these new kind of entrepreneurial business techniques with their showrooms and then promoting to other consumers as well, but using their, their fashion leaders as their kinds of their brand identity as well so you know it's almost like a modern influencer culture isn't it where someone gets something for free but then the, the the ripple effect of the dissemination of that information is really powerful and I think that 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 you know there's some who recognize that as a business model and certainly Wedgwood and Bolton are very strategically attempting to, to tap that for their business profit and they managed to do it successfully I'm not sure that all businesses achieve that in quite the same way but maybe that's you know those most famous names are useful to us for showing us how how those some are surviving and some are, and some are falling behind. Yes, to reinforce Hannah's point, I mean Bolton said something like, "Oh, my posh clocks, and you know my ormolu is all very well, but my fortune is built on buttons." So you know it's that uh, so he's very conscious that he's got these lost leaders, but that that's going to carry a vast middle market with him. And, you know, in this huge prosperous middle market is what is very distinctive about Britain in 18th century Europe. Um, we had another question that came in. So we've done capital for the stock. Come. Oh, Ackerman's repository, something you know about. Anna. And then hang on, Isabel asks, um, you said they're confectioners for the court in the West End. Do you have information on dress orders for the drawing rooms? Um, Isabel, I don't know if you need something specific. I do have quite a lot of information about do you mean dress orders from people attending court or the actual regulations that were issued by the court in terms of what you had to wear? Um, not sure if you want to, about formal dress. Um, so I've got, well, I've got both what people wore to court and how they placed those orders with their dressmakers, but then also the court issued its own regulations about what was the ex expected kind of attire. And those exist in the court records through the Lord Chamberlain's accounts, and they're often published in the newspapers in the advance of drawing rooms and things like that. So you can, you can get to that from both sides, both what the people were wearing and how they ordered it from their, their makers, and then also what the court was requiring people to wear through the information that they were advertising. Um, if you want that information, you can just get in touch with me if you want, to, if you need to, if, it, if it relates to something that, some work that you're doing. Um, and then, Ackerman, you can really see something in Ackerman's repository um, uh, with its fashion and furniture plates and its scraps of, yes, I think, yes, you can. I think, I mean, and Ackerman is a bit like, um, you know, Wedgwood and Bolton. So for those of you who don't know, Ackerman's repository is a magazine that's published, in, I can't remember the first date it starts, but certainly early 1800s, that um, combines a lot of information about manufacturing and fashion and new consumer goods that really centered around the West End. Um, and I was actually looking through Ackerman's repository again recently, trying to see exactly where the shops were that are mentioned in Ackerman, because Ackerman claims to be representing the best of British trade, celebrating a kind of national identity of, of British manufacturing. But actually, when you start to look at the goods that are advertised, they're all people who are basically the shops around Ackerman's own repository, which is like a warehouse, a little bit like Wedgwood's on the Strand. 
and you know almost all of the people advertising are basically two doors down <laughs> from Ackerman <laughs> and then he's hardly they're kind of representing British manufacturing at all I think there's only kind of one business that's out outside London and everyone else is not just in London but actually right right in the West End um, so yeah Ackerman's repository combining fashion and furniture plates and its scraps of fabric it has little samples that you get within the magazine as well it is kind of it is collating the West End in its pages and then promoting it but it's also suggesting it's representing British British commercial culture, but it's not really, it's representing that this West End identity, I think. But, um... Do we have any more questions? I think we've exhausted our West End <laughs> shopping <laughs> experience. <laughs> well, if that's the case, you 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 can still. Oh, that's another. If, if you're on the verge of asking a question, ah, oh, there you go. Could I ask one about Southern shopping? Yes, please do. Shall I try, Anna? Um, I Is Anna going to ask the question? Do you want us to? Annie, is that uh, it's the question of the yeah, I can ask a specific one. Um, <laughs> usually when you read about consumer theory and especially the sort of aristocratic bon ton who you're talking about in the West End shopping, there's the sort of second level down. So you've got ladies and gentlemen going out and getting their knives or their ribbons or whatever it is that's a personal sort of shopping experience. But then there's not just the sort of groceries, but also the everyday stuff such as chinaware teapots, tupperware for the kitchen, um, the kind of everyday things of life that wouldn't usually be chosen necessarily by um, the, the peerage themselves, but by housekeepers or butlers or even further down the scales of those that are doing the shopping. So presumably those shops existed in the West End, it wasn't a question of mail ordering in or just, just having deliveries. So have you got any experience or any stuff in the various research bits and pieces that you've been looking at which pertains either to servant shopping for the household or obviously for servant shopping for themselves and did you end up with a sort of second tier of shops in the West End aiming not just at the peerage but at the hangers-on who came with them so the wider household um, you know for example do you end up with shops that are clearly aiming at those that have got the wealth to shop there and have got the sort of fixtures and fittings and all the rest and then a secondary shopping street clearly or not clearly aiming at the kitchen maids, the housemaids and that level that kind of springs up because of the presence of the aristocracy in that area. Um, I'm sure that you do have that in the West End. I mean, I think one of the things that I'm interested, or we're interested in, in kind of developing is the idea of the West End as a kind of complete campus experience that meets all the needs of everybody who's within it. And of course, the you know the, the people at the top of that tree are the aristocrats who are there for the season, but there are also their households and the other people living in there. And I'm sure that you do get all of those other kinds of businesses serving their needs too. And I mean, one of the you know studies that I was most interested in recently was um, Tom Almuth Williams's book on animals in London, kind of city of beasts and all of the places in which people are keeping pigs and cows and. And, um, you know, and, and all of the kinds of provisioning that goes on um, in those West End streets. So behind St. James's Street, you get the other smaller streets where you might find some of those stores and things like that. So I'm sure you do get that. And I think that's something that Amanda and I want to, well, I'm saying on our behalf, Amanda, we want to develop further is this kind of campus idea that the West End isn't just luxury. It is its own town that meets every need um, and, and in quite a concentrated space. And that's one of the reasons it, it's... Um, it kind of develops as it does. And, and within the literature, we find that interesting because often we think about the history of consumption and businesses through these kind of micro districts that where an area becomes particularly associated with carriage making or particularly associated with, with silks, but actually the West End seems to bring all of these trades together into this kind of campus experience. Um, I'm sure we'd find lots of servant shopping for the households and providing those things. I, you know, the Beaumont work I did was really just on the richest people's letters and diaries um, but of those households have these household stewards and I think you could 
crack the archives in that way by looking at the household receipts, by looking at what the steward's signing off on. I mean, I've been doing it, some of it for the court because the court provisioning is, works on a bigger scale to an aristocratic household. Um, but um, yeah, it would be really interesting to see how the servants are shopping too. And there's a diary of a footman that was published in the early 1800s, that's from the early 1800s. And he talks a lot about his perambulations around town and going to other houses. I wonder if he stops off at some shops. I should I just know that the look. Twinings were giving, not quite backhanders, but it, there's a gift book in their archive where they, they're clearly giving, um, I think it's mainly tea from memory, to specific named servants within each aristocratic household. And they're doing that on a fairly regular basis. The book goes from, I think, 1819 to 1870 from memory and lists all of the major aristocratic households in Britain by the end of it um, with their stewards or housekeepers. Also, the clubs and the hotels are in there with listed people and they're always doormen or sort of mid, mid to high ranking staff that are getting these gifts of tea clearly to keep them um, buying Twining's tea and Twining's of course claim to be supplying everybody now. Um, <laughs> but do you think that's an effort to kind of product place within their household to then get the bigger orders? I don't know the... I mean they're, they're order books which the, the order books don't match up with the gift books because their archive got blitzed uh, literally blitzed in 1941 um, and they do seem to be supplying most of the major aristocrats but then they've got you know, this fierce competition because there's Antrobus and there's a couple of other big tea merchants at the time. Um, so I don't I mean they they I don't know, they claim they were supplying the clubs themselves, not just the footmen, but it's quite a good question. I would have thought there's a strong possibility they would have been sliding it into housekeepers and butlers' hands in order for them to recommend upwards. But on the other hand, this is the era where twinings are kind of supplying all the tea to the local merchants as well. So their network, there's only four or five big dealers. And they're really well known by that point because of the fact that Richard Twining got involved with the Commutation Act and, you know, you couldn't avoid his name for about 10 mm. years. So mm. Mm. The other community, though, which I think is worth thinking about, uh, harking back to our political day stuff, is that um, you've got loads and loads of men coming to London for the political term and not all of them, you know, so in the Commons, they don't, you know, they don't... They can't always rent, you know, so in the early period there are a lot of them, they're kind of staying in clubs or they're renting on their own, they're leaving their families at home and they need to be, and a lot of them are single men. And so, you know, they need laundry, you know, they need their dinner. And so they're going, so there's a whole kind of network of places which supply them I mean the clubs are kind of homes from homes but also you know the the coffee houses the chop houses the the lawn the lawn dresses all of that and you can see why you know that well what London is also kind of magnet for single women looking for work so there's masses of, of sort of service work for women keeping these kind of single men going as well so there's a you know there's another kind of a population at, um, who were, you know, not necessarily, you know, these kind of glittering parliamentary families who were trafficking the streets of Westminster. And what we know from kind of looking at the um, uh, close focus research on Westminster, this, it's still more diverse than you might think. And it's more diverse than say Marylebone. Because Marylebone is, you know, this entirely new kind of development but Westminster still does have its little kind of alleys and you know some parts of it it has these kind of little kind of sort of rookeries as well so there is more it, it still has elements of grunge within it as well as kind of glitter on the top whereas Marylebone which is all built all of a piece is a bit more uniform but um but I'm sure you're right Annie in what you say about servants because I mean I know that all the guidebooks tell women to you know not let a servant go shopping say you know for chicken and that you've got to sniff the chicken and put your thumb in the chicken and all of this but I can't see duchesses doing that so clearly that is the housekeeper 
Who's I've never uh, seen a description of chicken chopping in any aristocratic letter that yeah, I've ever read. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but Bessie Ramsden was probably doing that. Yeah, she would have been. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, But in Lady Spencer's list of London tradesmen, it, she does include her nail cutter, which is not someone, which I think is probably her actual fingernails rather than any other kinds of nails. And so you sometimes get these other glimpses of just the ordinary business of, of London life um, through, through her records. And... But I think it's really interesting what you're saying about twinings. I'm still thinking about, about that and wondering whether they're placing things or not. And, um, and the only other thing that comes to mind on that is, you know, the, when I worked on the Beaumont, I was really interested that they, they never mentioned, they didn't really have brand awareness. It's not like they were pursuing yeah. the luxury brands. And, and that was because, you know, I was coming out of then of the RCA and the v which was kind of celebrating the idea of the designer. So we're expecting to find this kind of veneration of someone wanting a product because it was associated with the designer. Those aristocratic shoppers in the 18th century, they, they don't, you know, Bolton, Wedgwood, it's no one to them. They, they shop because they buy those products because their friends are buying them. And it's all about that kind of, of network of, of personal uh, kind of recommendations amongst that high end of shopper. And they, they shop what their neighbours have shopped for rather than seeking out the luxury brands. And so maybe also, Twinings are trying to, 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 I don't know, you know, maybe that's the emergence of the well, the Wedgwood is the one who's saying this is a Wedgwood teapot. So it's one of the few who, and, and I'm sure Bolton is trying it too, and that they are trying to build, I would argue that they are trying to build brand awareness. And this, the sort of idea of the brand is gaining ground, but it's very unusual. I think within yeah. tea you get it based on adulteration because there's so much publicity around tea adulteration. I think the big tea companies try and build brand awareness based on the fact that you will buy their tea and it won't have mm. um, sheep poo in and um, leaves. Yeah. Well, the other apparently the pioneers of like the brand were people who like Daffy's Elixir and you know all these horrible kind of potions. So it's as but I think I'm sure you're right that it's about this kind of idea of reliability. But but you know Wedgwood was quite early to the you know there are teapots and there are Wedgwood teapots. You know so he is trying hard on that. But I'm sure. But I think Hannah's right that I've never heard them say, oh you know it's a Parker and Wakelin silver you know tea service. I never read anything like that. <laughs> There's a couple of questions, new questions in the chat. So whether the traders behavior changed as the period of the season shifted is your first question. And also this question, do you know how dressmakers and fashion traders decided on what should become fashionable? Um, no, I think this comes back to the point I said about sort of alchemy. They didn't always know whether something was going to kind of take off or not, you know, it was a cop. Um, but I think also, you know, they, they might come up with something new, say in conversation with Georgiana, Duchess of Devonshire, and that might take off. But on the other hand, sometimes people decided that this was a sort of absurd option, which was only appropriate on the peerage. So I, I think they, uh, they often didn't really know what was gonna work and what wasn't going to work. And so I think it was high risk, but I think it was a balance of, you know, the direction of travel from the season before and, you know, and, and what key uh, leaders of fashion decided they were going to take up and wear and then would get reported. But then whether it takes off in the rest of the country, that's a difficult thing, a different thing again. It's, whether or not it was felt um, um, acceptable, adaptable, something that you know people might find appealing. But one thing I would say is for long periods in the 18th century, fashion change is very incremental. There are only a couple of moments really. I mean, I, I think the 1790s is a critical shift when you go to the kind of, you know, you're moving into the empire line. But in the 1760s and 70s, it was a business of, is it three ruffles or two on your sleeve? So it's, um, you know, it's not so dramatic. 
Mm-hmm. So it's bit easier to nudge, I think. Yeah, and there's been, I mean, there's been some interesting work on kind of fashion plates and things like that. And I'm thinking about the work of Serena Dyer. I don't know if she's here or not today, but um, looking at how fashion plates actually influence fashion and the making of things. And, and you know, some of the, the points that I remember from her work, of course, that the publication of the fashion plate is significantly after the moment of fashion. Yeah. So, you know, when you get those women's pocketbooks, they've got the fold out fashion plates or something like that. Actually, that's last year's fashion wear, really. So it's, I think we need to sort of, change how we think about a fashion cycle away from a kind of modern mo- modern system mm. to something that's slightly different. Um, it's clear from the kind of rich people's letters, the aristocratic women's letters, that there's a lot of information that comes from the, the mantua makers and, and the silk merchants in terms of what's flying off the shelves or not. And, and so there's a sense in which some people want to shop with whatever it's in whatever else everyone else is buying and stay in the system and then others want to find something that's a different pattern or something um, that hasn't yet been purchased so there's two different kinds of consumers happening within that fashionable world the ones who want to fit in and the ones who want to stand apart and they are quite dependent on the kind of commercial information from the the suppliers about what is their best seller in the run-up um, to the season so that might be another way to kind of get into that information um, and then there's, you know, there's other moments as well. So a place like Ackerman's repository, they tend to associate a particular fabric sample with a particular dress worn by a particular person. But in order for that to have any contemporary fashion relevance, they must have had to have obtained that information off the shelf from the supplier themselves in order for it to have any kind of instance, you know, kind of importance for the consumer. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I don't know, I'm not giving a very good answer to it, but I think they're interesting to try and think about this, the cycle of fashion information and maybe we need to map the pocket publication against the season and actually the newspapers give the most instant information about fashion news because they're daily in London and you do get lengthy descriptions of what people are wearing there, which are kind of very text-based. And so maybe that's the most immediate source of fashion news that people get. And then alongside that are the magazine publications and the fashion plates and things that have a slower kind of cycle to them. I mean, I think interpreting fashion can be quite an anxious business, particularly if you're outside London. So, you know, because what you've got, so say you're, just say you take the town of Preston, say if you're in Preston and you've got a, some letters from London and you've got... Um, you know, and then you've got the pocketbooks, um, and then you go and talk to your mantra maker, and it's sort of, well, you know, can we make something like this, but not too much like this because it's Preston, not St. James's. So, and, you know, it's a whole bespoke system where everybody's trying to make those assessments all the time. So, and as Hannah was saying, you know, I think a lot of people want to fit in and not stand out. And so that's why they're on endlessly writing and saying, could you give me a bit more information about this and exactly how long is the sleeve mm. ruffle? Whereas I think, you know, some of these uh, aristocratic leaders have much more confidence and panache and, mm. you, know, and you know, they are public women and they can get away. It certainly does have a great bus station. <laughs> Preston great has a great bus station. Second largest bus station in Europe, I think, you know. <laughs> Not the carriage trade, then Amanda. <laughs> I've ruined. I've ruined. Ruined. <laughs> um, but um, I mean, actually, you know, the kind of description of fashions as well that you get in letters, you know, that's always really interesting how people share information about what they're wearing. And, and you know, one of the ways, I suppose, in which we've instinctively read that is about the gathering of fashion news, the wanting to be up to date. But you could perhaps read it differently also and see it as a form of anxiety about a checking a kind of am I going to be right is this right what's coming next and so you could potentially read some of those sources through a slightly different lens in terms of anxiety rather than mm. aspiration um, uh, we have a question which I don't think we've answered have you seen the traders behavior change as the period of the season shifted I mean the difficulty we have is trying to find enough self-conscious commentary from you know retailers and suppliers Mm -hmm. and you know we'd love them to say things like well we have now moved our shop to Pall Mall but it's very annoying because we only have custom for five months of the year you know they just unfortunately (laughs) don't write those things down that would help us but these are exactly the questions 
that we are, have in mind mm. and when we're and, gathering all our data, trying to the, think about it. And most of the business records are for those big companies which survive, you know, like, you know, so Bolton has a lot of letter books that, that we use. And so he talks about trying to, to build his trade before the season ends and things like that, which is very useful, but, but they're only the, the surviving businesses, you know, so few business records that represent the ordinary trader actually survive today. There's a few in kind of chancery cases where there's been some economic dispute. That's where I found, you know, some of the jewelers who are maybe less well known. And those records, of course, would be the ones to tell us like, oh, my business is about to fail because everyone's left London. But um, but those records tend to, to disappear. Um, but we do see a kind of increase of activity in, you know, Bolton and Wedgwood are certainly very season focused, I think, aren't they, Amanda? Yeah. And in terms of how they're kind of organizing their business, trying to attract clientele, um, the kind of the rhythms of their of their cycle of trying to get new goods in before the end of the season and things like that. But um, I, you, we should be wary about presuming that's typical of all of the business practices in the West End because I think the vast majority of businesses are not those, um, and they don't they don't survive and they don't they don't necessarily have the records to help us. Um. But we also should uh, not completely see the world from the point of view of the parliamentary classes and the fashion leaders. It's, it's hilarious when they say, London is empty. <laughs> and it's, you know, the largest city in Western Europe, even if they have cleared off to their country. So, you know, they just think they can only see themselves. You know, I went to the opera and nobody was there, but you know, it's a full house. What they mean is there were no duchesses there. So that, you know, there is still a population in London, and there is still a visiting population, and um, and given Anglomania, there's a big international visiting population. So it's possible that these uh, this you know this sat out. Oh, everybody's out of town. We're going to be ruined. You know, perhaps that is exaggerated. Yeah, you know, I think the satire is, isn't it? That's the whole kind of joke of out of town as well. Everybody's out of town. Well, actually, all these people are not out of town because they're waiting to be paid for things. Like about two people are out of town and the rest of the people are still there wondering wondering where all their money's gone. <laughs> so, but I'm sure that this is, as Hannah was saying, it's when it's like the end of season sales as well go on. And um, yeah, you know, and I'm, I'm sure we've seen the same, say in London in August, you know, kind of the, the sort of, well, quite leaving apart the pandemic, but you know, Bond Street is in the doldrums. In August. By Paris in the in in August. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It you know, there's not a lot sort of going on. There's a bit of end of season sail rail, and that is it. I I had another question about the circulation um, and the and you described really well the kind of which I had no I had never thought about the scattered reality what you call the diaspora of politics like the, the way they had to go from different you know from one place to another satellite meeting mm -hmm. room um, mm -hmm. and the same with the court um, now and you talked about you know the paving act and then the sedan chairs do you and I imagine it's difficult it's like that information like people to be vocal about and they're not but mm -hmm. uh, do you have any idea about what would be the heat map? I like I liked your heat map too, mm -hmm. of the type of uh, mobility means that people would use. Like, would they walk? Uh, would they, you know, for what distance would people walk? For what pe distance would people take a higher chair? Would they go in their own carriage um, higher? Um, and whether you can kind of map that to different types of customers, male, female. Well, one of the things that Hannah and I did is actually we walked some of these key routes and we worked out that it took you three minutes from St. James's Square to the clubs on St. James's Street. And then it took another maybe two minutes to court. And then was it about 12 minutes, Hannah, from court oh, yes. to Parliament? So it's all, it, it's hard to convey how tiny this is, you know, so... Um, you know, it's probably about the size of Queen Mary or something, you know, so it, it and, and so you could, you could walk it and um, a carriage, because of the traffic, um, a carriage might be difficult and it would be probably, probably if it, if it was wet weather, it probably would be much quicker in a sedan and 
Um, and clearly the sedan chair culture of London was very vibrant. And the men who, um, they were sort of pinups, the men who carried the sedans. They were like these sort of hunky young men and they used to have races in Hyde Park. So they were the sort of, so they're obviously kind of very fit and muscular running about. But, um, but the, the last sedan chair rank in London was in St. James's. But by about the third decade of the 19th century, they become redundant because um, you could no longer carry somebody from one side of London to the other, it was too much. So the, the, you know, the, the, you know, the broader distances are getting too, too much, but the focus is still very, very tight, which enables people to you know, do a bit of shopping um, or go to court, go to the club, I mean, one of the things that Hannah and I are quite interested in is when did parliamentarians dress? So if they're going out for dinner, they don't know what to do. You know, oh, am I going to give my speech in the Lords in full dress? But sometimes they go to their clubs and they leave their clothes there and change and then they go out to dinner. But I, I, but I think it's, um, it, it, it's a very varied a, a day which integrates um, politics, you know, uh, Westminster politics in Parliament, politics in court, um, and then heterosexual sociability in the evening, and with all sorts of other activities fitted all around that. I mean, on St. James's Street itself, you know, so a lot of the, you could drop in just on your way, you know, to court and go and um, go and buy your you know, your wine at Berry Brothers and your hat at Lots or, and, or also look at a print shop window as well. So there's clearly a kind of um, a sort of runway that um, people are very aware of. Is there anything you'd add to that, Matt? No, but I think, um, I'm trying to remember, I, mean, I think buried in the footnotes of our political day article at some point, we'd, well, I can't remember if we'd put it in in the end, I, there was some data from kind of Pocket books about the distances you could go in a rented sedan chair and carriage, mm -hmm. and there's like a fixed rate map where, which is basically the West End, where as long as you stay within a particular circuit, it's always a totally fixed rate, um, and then beyond that, it was sort of an extra surplus of money, and and that was interesting because it kind of mapped means of transportation specifically onto a geography. Um, I think most of the aristocratic families have their own sedan chairs. It seems to be part and parcel of your equipment for the London season. And they have a carriage and they do a lot of things on foot. And actually being seen on foot is quite an important part of the kind of fashion runway of London. So, you know, you see that a lot in, in, in the kind of satirical prints, which are often drawn from life of people on the streets of St. James's. Um, I think the sedan chair is used a lot for convenience to get around within a small location. But I think the carriage remains really important as well. And from my recollection, sometimes aristocratic ladies send their carriage out on its own to go and pick something up because it's very visible. And so if you have a carriage waiting outside a place or a set of shops, it's also a way of kind of, you know, your proxy presence in London as an aristocratic family as well. You just send the carriage on a little, mm. on a little tour. And, um, you know, yeah, some people... Yeah, yeah, go on, Amanda. That reminds me of Reynolds, who never got in his carriage, but, you know, had it all done up and then just had it circle London. So that, you know. Yeah, I'm you know, here. Like, yeah. like, like, <laughs> so everybody knew he was grand enough. It's like the Queen's body double today, just like someone there waving. Like, exactly. <laughs> she didn't exactly. have to leave the house. <laughs> just to say, I'm here. Yeah. Actually, one of the point, questions that somebody said about the West End interiors. I'm reminded of um, um, the interior, the showrooms of painters, and so um, they felt um, very to succeed as a painter, you had to have a kind of a showroom and you know a studio, but it had to be decorated in a grand manner so that the elite would feel happy to be, you know, sitting there. So they, a lot of, some of these kind of suppliers to aristocracy had to somehow ape the aristocracy in their fixtures and fittings. Whereas I think it was Reynolds said he knew of, you know, in one year he knew of, you know, five artists who bankrupted themselves in setting up these kind of um, palatial settings. And so, you know, and Angelica Kaufman writes about this a lot, about the strain of having to, 
you know, to give this kind of, you know, a, a setting which is quasi aristocratic. So, or at least that aristocratic ladies would feel comfortable kind of sitting there. So I, I you know, I think a certain kind of splendor of apparatus is uh, de rigueur. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for your questions. Thank you very much. We'll have to work further on these. We'll work through them, won't we, Hannah? Mm. Thank you very much. And thank you everybody for um, tuning in. Mm. Um, the next session, I always forget to put the page up for the date. Aurélie, come to my restaurant. Ah, I don't remember. <laughs> date, ah, yeah, it's yet. Uh, le 13 juin, uh, voilà. June the 13th. The June the 13th. Uh, mm -hmm. This session will be in French this mm -hmm. time. Uh, we'll have the pleasure of listening to Florence Magno Ogilpi uh, from the University de Rennes 2. Uh, and she'll be talking about déchiffrage et lexique des façons, l'activité herméneutique de la rencontre chez Robert Schall uh, and Anna Roland, uh, also from the University of Rennes, uh, who will be talking about uh, apparence et sociabilité dans le théâtre de Molière. So a more literary uh, session next time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna and Anna. Yeah, thank you very much. It was very, very interesting.